we're going to need to do things differently. And there's going to be things that are not going to be easy, and there's going to be things that are not going to be pleasant. But it's going to be required if we're going to stay ahead of these increasingly impactful, devastating types of storms. Today, we hear from an emergency management all-star, not just for the state of Florida, but all of America, about the lessons from Hurricane Ian and what lies ahead. Here from Ballard Studios, it's 13th and Park. The future doesn't belong to the faint heart. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. We will make America strong again. We will get through this together. I can hear you. Today, we're very excited to have Craig Fugate with us. And let me just offer some of these descriptors. Fireman, paramedic, county emergency management chief, director of the Florida Division of Emergency Management under two Republican Florida governors, then was appointed by President Barack Obama to lead FEMA. Claim to fame, if you want to call it that, is he was on duty for the big four. Hurricanes Charlie, Francis, Gene, and Ivan. Uh, and even more famously, created the Waffle House Index, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, welcome to the show, Craig. We're thrilled uh, to have you. We know that you've been besieged with requests, and the information you provide has been invaluable in allowing the public to understand what's happened and what's ahead. Justin? Craig, great to have you with us. So obviously right now, a big topic, the natural disaster that just hit the state of Florida. So much to talk about there. One of the issues that's come up recently is the uh, the timing of the evacuation order that was issued by Lee County. Uh, That evacuation order was issued on Tuesday morning. The uh, storm, Ian, made landfall a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, How much time should residents be given, ideally, uh, to evacuate before the storm makes landfall? Well, you know, this is a complex question. There's not a simple answer. Uh, one of the things that FEMA does, working with the states, the National Hurricane Center, the, the local governments, uh, the Corps of Engineers, is they do the planning and support the planning on what areas would have to evacuate in storm surge. And then they work on something that in the in, inside of emergency management we call clearance times. Mm-hmm. And that is based upon the storm track and how much areas would likely see flooding, how many people live there, what the road capacity is. You make a determination on what your clearance time is, and that is to get people out of those areas before the arrival of tropical force winds. Now, if you can imagine, if you're familiar with Florida, that's going to be very different between counties, depending upon how large their population is, how their road networks are, and how far people are having to go. So that's why there's not like one uniform answer for every county. Got it. And I think that's one of the things you have to understand is, it's a decision that locals make based upon all of these tools they're given, but it's a decision each county is making based upon their populations, mm-hmm. their evacuation routes, and when they're forecast to have those arrival of tropical force winds. One of the issues that's come up is the actual uh, forecast track. There are two models, as you know. These there, There's the American computer model and there's the European computer model. The American model was way off. Uh, it thought that there was going to be a category storm headed towards the panhandle of Florida. The European model, which has faster computers, supercomputers, was not that far off about where it ma- the storm made landfall. Should the American computer model be discarded or not used in the future, and should we rely more on the European computer model? Well, what the Hurricane Center does is they do what they call ensembles, and they take all of these m- models. There are several that are what they call the, the high performers. And if you are reading the statements, and again, these are things the public wouldn't be expected to understand, but emergency managers and meteorologists are looking at this. They said there was uncertainty in this forecast track because these major models were diverging. As you got closer to landfall, the models actually came together. Hmm. And I think this is one of the challenges that the Hurricane Center has is communicating. And if you remember when Max Mayfield was the director of the Hurricane Center, he said, don't focus on the skinny black line. I think we have this tendency to think of hurricanes like it's a point on the map instead of an area of impact. And if you're familiar with Southwest Florida, that is an area that's very susceptible to storm surge. And it doesn't require the center of circulation necessarily to hit, to cause those problems. 
And I think that's why when initially everybody was focused on Tampa, I remember I was talking to one of the networks and they were talking about Tampa. And I'm saying, you really need to be talking about everything down to Naples because this is too close. And if you remember Hurricane Charlie, we had the same problem. It hit within the air cone, but the track line was going to Tampa as it began moving more towards the east and made landfall further south in Ponte Gorda. Right. Well, that's a a very interesting point. That was going to be my next question. Uh, And that is uh, news media coverage of this. And uh, the apparently uh, I read a news report that said that the area of impact of the storm center never left the cone uh, for five days prior to making landfall, that that area was always in the cone. Uh, but it might not have been where that black line is. Uh, but the issue, though, is is when you have the cone impacting a wide uh, area, the news media seemed like they focused on the area of where the most damage could be done, which was the Tampa Bay area. And social science research has shown that in many cases, people, when they're told where the impact might be originally, they kind of lock into that original forecast. So what responsibility does the news media have to not necessarily give a head fake to the, the, their viewers and to communicate more clearly that the area of greatest impact isn't necessarily where the storm may hit? My short answer is listen to your local TV and radio stations. Mm. If you go down and look at what Wink TV was doing down in Naples, they were very clearly telling people that we're not out of the woods. We're not out of the danger zone. Uh, One of the other things is the hurricane center is is forecasting the storm surge potential, the wind potentials, and overall track. But they don't necessarily forecast the impacts. So if you were going to Tampa Bay weather, and again, this is something that I think we've got to figure out how to get this information to the public. They were putting out impact maps showing areas of impact for storm surge, areas of impact for high winds, areas of impact for extreme rain, and impacts of tornadoes. And those were showing a much broader area. And again, this is, I think, is is conceptually, we've got to figure out with the social scientists, how do we communicate impacts of hurricanes so that we're not always going to this point on the map or necessarily, if you look where the national media was going, they went to the major market. They went to Tampa. Right. But when you get down to, you know, you start moving south, Bradenton, Sarasota, you know, Port Charlotte, down into Fort Myers, and then down to Naples, Mm -hmm. it was the local TV and radio stations that in many cases were doing a a much better job of trying to communicate, we still have a lot of risk here, and this storm is going to cause big problems here. But the national media, and I, I don't fault them, it's just the weight of the nature, they're going to where they see the most likely areas of impact. But if you notice, you know, I always start out with the Weather Channel, and I love Jim Cantori, but, you know, when you, wherever Jim goes is probably one of the safer places. He very rarely <laughs> right. ever gets hit. <laughs> but if you right. notice the Weather Channel, as soon as they started seeing those models changing and the forecast changing, they started moving their meteorologists out of Tampa Bay further south. Yeah. You know, you're very big, uh, Craig, have always been on training. Train, train, train. Prepare and train, right? Uh, with You always used to, you know, bust in on employees and say, okay, category four, what do we do, right? Those yeah. kinds of exercises, which is terrific. Doesn't the news and media, doesn't news media also maybe benefit from that kind of training to the seasons, the kind of reporting they have so they, they're more accurate, you might say, and more timely in their accuracy uh, when a storm like this blows through? Yeah, I mean, this actually is not a new conversation. Uh, if you go back to Hurricane, um, well, it's Hurricane Floyd, Remember that storm going up the Florida uh, East Coast, and they were comparing it to Andrew, and it was mm-hmm. like, here's little Andrew, and here's Floyd, this huge monster storm. And we started seeing evacuations taking place that were you know, far in excess of what local officials were forecasting because it wasn't coming ashore. And we saw millions of people evacuating because the national media kept hyping this was a huge, dangerous storm, That's and it. everybody was looking at the satellite image. Um, and so I remember I was, I was up in a meeting. I was still with the state. I was up in a meeting in Washington. You had the Weather Channel, a lot of other folks, the National Hurricane Center. And it really came back to how do you communicate this? Because uh, you, know, the, 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 you got this really scary storm. It's really getting a lot of attention. Yet the local officials were only doing some precautionary evacuations on some of the barrier islands, things like the RV parks, things like that. But they weren't ordering major evacuations because they were still not looking at any direct landfall effects. 
what kind of natural disaster keeps you up at night? When I say that, I mean, which of the big five or six, right? Hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, floods, earthquakes, uh, forest fires. What's the one you you know is going to be the most complex and potentially difficult to effectively address? Geomagnetic storms. Wow. Uh, people don't think about it because it's something that, you know, it's kind of this, we, we talk about it, but nobody really has experienced. But we go back to uh, the 1850s. There was this event called the Clarendon event where you had this major geomagnetic storm. It was so powerful that the telegraph operators could disconnect their batteries and their telegraph still work. Wires were bursting into flames. Wow. And it has, it has the ability to, to disrupt uh, communications, uh, satellites, uh, power grid. And it's, it's one of these phenomena that is, as we're learning more and more about, it's, it's in, our, in our era, it is a potentially... Uh, you know, most disasters affect a, a geographically defined area. And, you know, COVID we had all over the country. Now imagine damages to very large transformers, electrical grid, communication systems across the entire United States at the same time. How often does that happen? Fortunately, it's rare. But we'll periodically, you'll see a news flash that there's a geomagnetic storm or there's a coronal mass ejection heading our way. Uh, there's been impacts. I remember back in the nineties, we had one that knocked out, uh, some satellites, one of which carried a lot of uh, pager traffic back in the days before we had, uh, you know, the cellular phones and everybody had pagers and people were going, you know, my pager hasn't gone off in a couple of hours. I wonder what's going on. And it was the satellite that went down during one of these storms up in Canada, uh, hydro Quebec, they actually had one storm where it took the transformers and melted the cores of them. There was so much wow. energy being produced and, those kind of things, they're fortunately not frequent, but as our infrastructure and our dependencies have grown on things like satellite communications, GPS timing signals, and the power grid, it does uh, expose even greater risk. Hurricane Ian is now making landfall in Southwest Florida with winds of 155 miles per hour, and that is just shy of a category five hurricane. 155 mile an hour winds are incredibly dangerous. Uh, there will be debris in the air and flooding powerful enough to move cars around. Uh, so please do not be outside uh, during this storm. So, you know, it's interesting because going back to uh, hurricanes and the state of Florida, I was in Miami in 1992 when Hurricane uh, Andrew hit. Uh, it was a f few uh, weeks or a couple months before a presidential election in 1992. Uh, Lawton Childs, the governor of Florida at that time, made a famous statement, where the hell is the Calvary? Um, and then uh, we saw with Hurricane Katrina, uh, cr you know, criticism of uh, FEMA's response. And uh, even, I guess, uh, uh, two years ago or three years ago with Hurricane Maria uh, in Puerto Rico. And seems like FEMA is on the receiving end of a lot of criticism uh, over time. But um, can you explain what the relationship is be between a state's emergency response system and the federal government's response system? Is the federal government primarily responsible for emergency response or is it the state? It's the state. It's by constitution. Hmm. All power is not reserved in the federal government, belong to the states and the people, and disaster response is under the governor. Uh, FEMA's job is on behalf of the president to coordinate federal assistance to the state. And I was, you know, I had done this both at the state level and the federal level. And when I got to FEMA, I wanted to make it very clear to my, my, uh, my folks. I said, we stand behind the governor, not in front of the governor. Mm -hmm. And our job there is to support them and help them however we can. And sometimes it's, it's technical assistance, sometimes it's bad past experiences, but in most cases it's making sure the resources that they need are there before they need it. And what do you do in a situation where a state's emergency response system may not be up to the task of dealing with the, 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 the disaster that they're being confronted with? So I'll use some coach speech. We coach them up. Okay. <laughs> they're the players. They're the, they're, they're the talent on the field. Uh, we send experienced people in. Uh, we work with them. We support them. You know, a lot of times it's not that they're not able to do the job. It's just their first disaster of that scale. And it's just so overwhelming. And having people that can come in there and are not there to take over, not there to, you know, boss you around, but are there to support your team. I'll give you an example. Okay. When this storm was out there, before it ever hit Cuba, the FEMA – team was already heading down to the state EOC, the FEMA regional administrator. Uh, 
that that is based in Atlanta was in the state EOC. Those teams were actually syncing up. This is something that, you know, I think when we responded in the 04 hurricane season to all of those disasters, uh, my counterpart, Bill Carwell, is a federal coordinating officer. He and I basically uh, were, you know, stuck together. We we did we did everything together as a team. And we we had our two separate teams integrate that way. So logistics, state was sitting next to the federal logistics. So there wasn't this passing emails back and forth. They're sitting side by side dealing with these problems. And I think, you know, we talk about the separations of state and uh, federal government, separation of powers, and all stuff, you know, local, then state, then federal. I said, in a disaster, we need to collapse that down. And so if you remember, in Hurricane Charlie, we went to Charlotte County and set up base there. You know, we pretty much went to where the disasters were. I had great people back in the state EOC that could manage a lot of this stuff with their with our federal team there. But that was the thing I learned, and that's what I, I really took to FEMA is uh, we need to be there before they need it. And again, this is something after Katrina, Congress clarified. FEMA doesn't have to wait for the governor to put in a formal request to start spending federal dollars to oh, do that's research. That's interesting, yeah. So – you know, this is, again, the lesson is you never get time back. So if you think it's going to be bad, respond like it's bad because you can always turn stuff off. It's just hard to get caught back up if you get behind. Isn't this, uh, when you look at all the predictions of climatic weather-related events moving forward, and the predictions are fairly consistently saying uh, there's going to be a lot more of it. There are going to be more hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes, all the rest, you know, all the, the perils of, of, of nature. Um, are we better prepared today than we ever have been? And how much better must we be moving forward to be able to address what we know is coming? We're getting to the point of the system is, is starting to fray. If you look at what happened in, in 2017 with three hurricanes hitting, you know, basically three different states, mm-hmm. um, it pushed the response capabilities that we had built as a nation to the very limits. By the time they got to Marie, you know, in Puerto Rico, there was there was a lot of stuff that had already been deployed. They were have they had already been hit by Irma. Mm-hmm. Uh, they hadn't had a chance to restock from Irma, so it was a you know just extremely difficult. It's taking us too long to rebuild. Uh, I was at FEMA. We were still approving projects from Hurricane Katrina 10 years later. Wow. Uh, And as you point out, the frequency of these events, it's interesting. There's not necessarily a lot of data supporting increased frequency of hurricanes, but we are seeing more intensification, weather storms uh, of the ones we do get. In fact, they were looking at, you know, Category 4, Category 5 hurricanes. We've had more of those in the last five years than we probably had going back, you know, 20 years Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are seeing the impacts of climate. I would say what you saw in Central Florida, extreme rainfall, that's probably one of the clearer signals we're seeing in these storms is extreme rainfall that's well inland that we're seeing with these storms. Uh, and it goes back to, you know, where Florida's had some success in strengthening our building code. Uh, and those that are, again, primary focus on the wind impacts, but we still have the insurance industry who has not yet been able to figure out how to stay in these markets, yeah. stay profitable. Uh, you know, and so I think we're reaching a point where what we have been doing looking backwards is having a hard time keeping up with what's occurring going forward. Everything from where and how we build to how we manage risk, insurance, but also our response systems where we get into this long term recovery and we need to collapse that down and get in there and rebuild in years, not decades. And, you know, we still see the scars from Andrew in Miami Dade County. I mean, if you if you know that area, you know what changed. Homestead Air Force Base closed down. They came back as a reserve base. That took out so many jobs in the economy and yeah. in that part of the state. It took a long time for that even to get back to normal. Uh, so, again, I, I think we we have really need to start thinking about uh, going forward. We're going to need to do things differently. And there's going to be things that are not going to be easy. And there's going to be things that are not going to be pleasant. Uh But it's going to be required if we're going to stay ahead of these uh, increasingly impactful, devastating types of storms. Well, Craig, uh, I was going to ask you the final wrap-up question, more of a personal nature, but you kind of dropped one uh, as something (laughs) I got to follow up on right there. You said it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be pleasant. Can you elaborate on what's not going to be easy and what's not going to be pleasant if we need to adapt to the changing environment, uh, disaster environment that we're going to be living in? Yeah, again, a lot of the impacts of disasters come about from where we live, how we built, and our economic statuses. 
Okay. So it sounds like well, maybe where we live and how we build is going to have to change. Yeah. And we have to be careful. If you've watched storms in Florida, when we've had these storms hit, particularly our low income areas where there's a lot of you know rental and affordable housing, when those get wiped out, we tend to gentrify and build back better, right? More expensive, better on the tax base, but we keep displacing people. So if you go up to Mexico beach, you know, what they feared was going to happen has happened. They've, you know, a lot of people that live there said, you know, it's going to get gentrified. We're going to get priced out of our homes. And if you go back to Mexico Beach, except for the El Governor Hotel, there's very little signs that they got hit by a Cat 5 hurricane. It's all built back. Mm-hmm. It's built back better. It's built back much more expensive. It's no longer affordable for those residents who used to live there. So a last final wrap-up question. Uh, it's literally your job to wake up every day thinking about national natural disasters. So I'm curious, what does Craig Fugate do to relax and to (laughs) get his mind away from the worst calamities that happen to humans? Ham radio. (laughs) Is that right? I mean, I I kind of, I've been, I I was always interested in it when I got back from uh, FEMA. uh, I had more time. I got into it. And it it ties very nicely into the disaster stuff because in in some places down there after Ian hit, the only thing that could work was the ham radio operators. Right. So I've gotten involved in what they call amateur radio emergency services. I'm I'm fascinated by, you know, being able to communicate with people around the globe, uh, send emails and stuff without the internet, do emergency communications, but also just like seeing how far I can get out there and, and, and communicate with people, you know, what they call DXing. So it's an interesting hobby. I, I, my wife uh, thinks I spend far too much time on it sometimes, <laughs> uh, but it has a nice tie back into my, cons- my, my idea of how do we build resiliency. And it, this is the idea. What happens when the internet goes down? What happens when communications right. go down? What's left? And it turns out it's broadcasters, local radio and TV stations, uh, and ham radio operators. I, th- I think his, uh, his handle probably should be Mr. Calm. Uh, <laughs> Craig, we really appreciate it. Please keep doing what you're doing. What you really look for in crisis is expertise and cool. You have both of them. Uh, you've been um, you've been uh, supported uh, by members of uh, both parties, uh, leaders from both parties, for one reason. You know what to do, how to take an assessment of a situation, and then how to communicate it. And we're really privileged that you took some time with us today to share this with with us and with the rest of the world. Take care of yourself. Well, well, thanks for having me. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you, Craig. Thanks. Well, I don't know if I want to, like, duck under the table, (laughs) you know, to shelter myself from the next storm or not. But, wow, that was something, especially your last question. Yeah. uh, You know, I just couldn't resist asking his job for two decades has been thinking about disasters. So uh, I was just curious. And it was interesting that his hobby, the way he relaxes is – by communicating through That's ham it. radio. So That's that was it. that that was fascinating. But I, you know, this hot topic uh, that exists and it's, it should be debated and it should be reviewed in, in terms of both the 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 predict the prediction and the weather forecast that was made, the hurricane track forecast that was made about whether the local government officials uh, made the right decision uh, in terms of evacuation. But I do think that, as he said, it's a very complex decision. It depends on the road capacity. It depends on the population near the point of impact. So uh, those are complex questions, and I think that uh, there, you know that'll be reviewed, and hopefully we'll learn from it and do better the next time. Once you, but. Yeah, to your point and to your question, once the narrative is set, it's hard to upset that narrative or change that narrative. And five days out, the narrative was uh, to Tampa Bay, right. get ready for the big one. And I live in Tampa Bay, so I, I've seen these warnings come come and fortunately go. Uh, we took it very seriously. The news media basically not only took it seriously, they said, this is where it's going to be. Right. And the cone, which is fairly wide. All I think you have to communicate is if you're anywhere inside that cone, take great, the greatest precautions you possibly can. And the emergency management officials should you know, respond accordingly that if you're in the cone, you're in the cone of danger. Anything could happen. 
think worst case scenarios and hope for the best. Right, and that's that's the that's the lesson. Uh, but when you have this the the population, the mass population that lived in that cone, if all of the people in the cone were to attempt to evacuate, uh, that would could potentially be a, a chaotic situation as well. I remember, I believe it was Hurricane. Um, Ivan, I believe, in, uh, in, in South Florida where people were evacuating mm-hmm. and they were running out of gas on I-95 going north to Orlando That's because it. there were there was so, the whole 95 from Miami to Orlando was a big parking lot. Yeah, so many millions of people were trying to get out of Miami and South Florida. So it's, it's a challenging question uh, for emergency planners. But I do think that the media has a responsibility in this. They need to make sure they continue to emphasize the fact that just because they're still and doing a stand-up from Tampa doesn't mean that's where it's going to go because I think that's where viewers can be misled. And I think Craig made a good point. He said, listen to your local news. So he focused on Wink, which is based in Fort Myers. That's the local TV station there. And he said they were communicating the right message, but some of these other national uh, news organizations weren't. Last thing is the politics of all this. Um, It was very, very refreshing to see uh, President Biden and Governor DeSantis in full conversation many times as they, as the storm was moving through and past the state of Florida. We have not always seen that. Katrina was was a, a mess when it came to politics, finger fingers of blame being pointed everywhere. Uh, we've seen that in other storms. Uh, we saw that with Sandy, uh, with uh, Governor Christie and, and the president. Uh, this time was different. Hopefully we've learned our lesson, right, that in these kinds of situations, this is where you unite and that that is good politics. Right. It is good politics. And it's interesting because we live in such a political uh, society that uh, I remember a few years ago, people were politicizing Father's Day. And uh, <laughs> right. I was like, wait a minute, is this really happening in the United States? And yeah, it's true. And so there's a temptation for politics to permeate everything that yep. happens. And I hope that natural disasters are one area that we can hold sacred, that don't uh, we don't have partisan politics. It's okay to hold government officials officials accountable for the decisions that they make, but Republican, Democrat, does shouldn't mean anything when you're dealing with a national disaster. Last thing you had to, had to bring up, the Waffle Index. So the <laughs> Waffle Index that Craig Fugate originated basically says that the Waffle House, which is open by reputation and, and reality 24-7, if the Waffle House is open in an area, it's okay in terms of a storm coming your way. If they start to limit their menu, be wary that something big might be headed. And if they are closed, panic. Right? I mean, <laughs> right. Panic, they're in trouble. Right? So uh, that's the Craig Fuge contribution to Modern Lore. Uh, another great uh, show, hopefully very informative. Uh, it certainly was for us and for everyone listening. Uh, there's not, we can't do enough to be prepared for emergencies and crises. And it's nice to know people like Craig Fuge and others are really good at it.